And I'd like to introduce Walter Wynn, who will be introducing and speaking on our first session today. Thank you for being with us. Welcome. We're going to start sharing the screen and we'll get going here. Okay. Well, I am the facilitator and the job of a facilitator is to identify speakers, introduce the speakers for each session, and moderate the Q&A after the talk. So here's what I was looking for in speaker number one. I was looking for a Gainesville native, a Naval Academy graduate, AEC licensed, Atomic Energy Commission licensed to operate a civilian research reactor, PhD in experimental reactor physics, Rick over selected and trained, qualified in supervision and operation of US Navy reactors, six years in nuclear submarines involving the supervision and operation of naval reactors, qualified for command of nuclear submarines, resident of Oak Hammock, preferably of the Outback. So I went over to the Outback and I looked all around and I looked in the mirror and sports a goatee and, and there I was. Okay, the second speaker, Clarkson University Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering, Rensselaer Poly, Master of Electrical Engineering, uh, Mechanical Engineering, Rick over selected and trained academically, qualified in supervision and operation of Army reactors, officer in charge of PM3A, nuclear reactor power plant, McMurdo Sound, Antarctica, wintered over in Antarctica, deep freeze 65. So we're running out of speakers pretty quickly here. Officer in charge, Naval Nuclear Power Unit, Fort Belvoir, which is an Army base. It's probably now Joint Base Fort Belvoir because since Goldwater, if you don't have experience in a Joint Base, you cannot be promoted to flag rank. So everybody's Joint Base somebody or other. Oak Hammock Founders Club member, sports a better goatee. And of course, that's Will Schaefer. Okay, how to make everything. I was going to tell you how to make everything from 30 ingredients, but that was going to be too long because I was going to have to go through and explain all the elementary particles and physics. So I'm just going to go with three ingredients. That's today. Next week, who put Manhattan in the Manhattan Project? U.S. Navy nuclear power programs, our third week. Fourth week, Army, Air Force, NASA, AEC, Chinese, <clears throat> and Russian space nuclear power programs, civilian nuclear power plants, and the last one will be nuclear disasters. So that it kind of explains the four-word slide that I started with. Okay, if we're going to make an atom bomb, we better look at some atoms. If we're going to make a nuclear bomb, we better look at some nuclei. And actually, atom bombs are every bomb that's ever made because it's a chemical reaction that blows up things. But we always talked about nuclear weapons in the military because that's the kinds that really blow up things. So if we're going to make hydrogen bomb, we have to talk about the sun. And I'll explain that later. Okay, how to make everything from three ingredients, neutrons, protons, and electrons. So to help us remember all that stuff, we'll go through a few things. But first, who or what is involved? Scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, chemistry, modern physics, quantum mechanics, fission and fusion, engineering to build things, bombs, we're gonna kind of end up on bombs and then talk about reactors. Scientists can be divided into experimenters and their view is sort of, well, let's try something and see what happens. 
and then the theoreticians, let's try to figure out what they did and why it makes sense. And sometimes the theoreticians will actually come up with something and tell the experimenters, go look for this. And it happens. Engineers, let's try to make something useful out of this. And then the entrepreneurs, let's make some money. So let's go into now the atoms. The smallest possible amount of matter which still retains its chemical properties. It has a nucleus and surrounded by electrons. Protons, positively charged subatomic particle, are forming a part of a nucleus in the atom and determining the atomic number of an element, and it weighs one atomic mass unit. Neutrons are a subatomic particle forming part of the nucleus of an atom. They don't all have neutrons, but nearly 99.9% have them. Electron, a much smaller subatomic particle surrounding the nucleus of an atom. It has a negative charge, minus one, equal to the positive charge of the proton, plus one. The number of electrons has to equal the number of the protons in order to keep the atom neutral. So the hydrogen atom on the left, one proton, one electron. On the right, we see the helium, two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. Okay, and these are some little things. The electron radius is about 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. A centimeter is about the width of a standard paper clip. So you have a one with about 16, 14 zeros in front of it. Proton mass is equal to the neutron mass, more or less, and it's 1.7 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams. So 1.7 preceded by 22 zeros, and they're 452 grams in a pound. So these guys are basically little tiny bits of nothing. And the reason I was going to have 30 ingredients to make everything because protons and neutrons are not elementary particles. They're made up of things called quarks, but we won't go into that unless we have time at the end. Okay, proton radius and the neutron radius is about the same, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Helium nuclear radius is about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. The helium atomic radius, including the electrons, is about 100 times bigger, 2 times 10 to the minus 11. The gold atomic radius is about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11. But the uranium atomic radius is 2.3 times 10 to the minus 11 centimeters. But the uranium nucleus physical cross-section, that is, if you can look at it as a disk, its cross-section would be 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. And when the theoreticians and the experimenters were measuring that, one of them said, that's as big as the side of a barn. So that became the measurement. 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters is equal to one barn. And the barn is a unit of affinity for an atom to accept neutrons, to bounce neutrons off of it. It's called cross of uh, the cross section for scattering. Cross section for capture is also measured in barns. Now, the space is basically everything is nothing. If you look at a gold atom and a the solar system, the sun at one foot, and scale everything from that, the earth is about 215 feet from the sun. And Pluto, back when it was a planet, was about 1.6 miles away on this scale. But if you look at a gold atom, the farthest electron is about 3.3 miles away from the center of the atom. So everything is nothing. If somebody says you have nothing in your head, say, that's right, I'm proud of it. 
Okay, along with antimatter and dark matter, we recently discovered the existence of doesn't matter, which appears to have no effect on the universe whatsoever. Okay, let's get into some chemistry. We'll talk about the elements. Compounds are chemical compounds like CO2, H2O. They're compounds made up of elements. And they're alloys. If you take some uh, copper and tin and pound it together, you can make brass. It's not a chemical combination. It's just some smashed atoms together to make a compound. We're going to look at the periodic table because there's so many atoms, it's very difficult to keep track of all of them without having some kind of a crutch to look at it. What are the chemical and other properties of these atoms? Well, an atom could be a, a gas. It could have a physical property of being a liquid. It could be a solid. And it could be chemically reactive, like H2O, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom that make a compound, and it's chemically active. It could be inert. I showed you helium earlier. It is an inert atom. And we'll, we'll look at that and figure out why that happens in a minute. The isotopes, iso meaning the same, tope meaning topo, the place. So they are the different number of neutrons, the same number of protons, but they are in the same place in the table of periodic elements. And your, your element could be stable or it could be it undergo radioactive decay. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's the carbon atom we see in the if I figure out how to do this, you see in the middle, there are six protons, six neutrons, and there are six electrons. Two are in the first so-called shell, the first circle, and the other four are in the outer circle. There is a, a quantum mechanic rule for how many electrons you can have in which shell, but the center, the closest shell, shell number one, can only have two. But here's an isotope. We see on the right-hand side, carbon-13. So they're both carbon, 612 and 613. The mass number is the bigger number, and the atomic number is how many protons and electrons. Now, these are the natural isotopes of carbon. There's carbon-12. And by definition, carbon-12 has an atomic weight identically equal to 12. Its isotope mass is 12, and the abundance is 98.9%. Carbon-13, about 1%. But carbon-14 is like one part per trillion, and it has a half-life of 5,700 years. Half-life means the amount of time by which the number of carbon-14 atoms will decrease to half of their original number. So every 5,700 years, you have half as many carbon-14 atoms as you had before, more or less. Let's do the more or less part. Nitrogen is 714, and I just show you that because we're going to deal with it. Nitrogen-14 on the left here will absorb a neutron from cosmic rays and cosmic radiation. It will become carbon-14, and it'll throw off a proton, so all the numbers on the top and the bottom add up to be the same. Carbon-14 itself will decay back to nitrogen-14, giving off an electron and a neutrino. Now, that was like 5,700-year half-life. Half -life. That's how we can measure things, how old they are. If you pick up, pick up a bone from 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, you know the rate at which 
the carbon-14 is decaying. Right now, we all are in uh, the same number of carbon-14s in our body because as it decays, we're breathing it in and it stays. So the amount of carbon-14 will remain constant over the centuries. But when you stop breathing, you stop taking in carbon-14 and you start decaying it so we can find out how old you are 10,000 years from now by looking at the very small amount of carbon-14 left in your body or the bones. Okay, so I'm just going to show a couple more atoms here. The neon atom. Neon is one of the noble gases or an inert gas, and you can see it has the inner shell has got two electrons. The outer shell has got eight electrons. Both shells are full. So it doesn't have any attendant, any, any uh, desire or ability to give away an electron or to take on an electron because it's full. If we look at a bigger, ooh, that's exciting. Hello. Oh, th this is still working. Here, here comes Julianne to fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the trick is that the atoms higher in the atomic number, they fill up their shells according to a rule. And it doesn't much matter to us. It just means that they are not chemically active if their shells, all of their outer shell is full. And this was on the wall, and I thought I should take a picture of it, and I'm glad I did. It's Mendeleev's original periodic table of the elements. But here is one that's pretty well filled up. So on the left, you can see the ones in pink. They have one extra or two extra neutrons in their shell. So they are very active chemically, and they want to meet up with these guys on the right, right, which have a hole or two or three or four in their outer shell so they can make a compound very easily. And on the far right, we have the noble gases. And... I'm not sure what this last one is. It's a transuranic element that probably has a half-life of like nothing. So if you look at these, potassium, sodium, lithium, beryllium, and all the rest of them, you can see where they all fit in the table of periodic elements. And if we go down to... 92 uranium, that's the last naturally occurring element in the table of periodic elements. All of these others beyond here and over here and, and all along in here are transuranic elements. They are made by bombing, bombarding uranium with neutrons and they keep going up the line, and some of them have half-lives of like microseconds. So we need to look at this. This is going to help us a lot. There's a thing called binding energy per nucleon. The nucleon is the number of things in the nucleus, and the binding energy will tell us whether or not it's going to be easy or difficult to have anything happen. But they all tend, whoops, wrong button here. They all tend to come in on the most stable region of the periodic table around iron. So on the left-hand side, we have the low number elements coming up. And what we're seeing here is that if we could take the hydrogen 2, which has got a deuterium, has an extra, nucle uh, an extra neutron, and we can take hydrogen 3, and if we could squeeze them together 
we can end up making helium-4, and it's way up there. It's going to give off a lot of energy, but it's going to require a great deal of energy to make that happen. And that's why I said, if you want a hydrogen bomb, we have to look at the sun. So the Hans Bethe, one of my professors at Cornell, received the Nobel Prize for positing that the sun was run on fusion and was making all, where's my laser? There it is. Was making all of these elements up to and including iron. So when you have a supernova, star exploding, you get all of these elements and some more on the other side because it's a very massive and energetic explosion. Now, if we look at the far side, we have uranium-235 and uranium-238 at the far end. And U-235, it turns out, is the uranium atom that we want to get our hands on because it's the one that will undergo fission. U-238 will not. But if you can get the fission from here, you end up with some two elements that are much lower on the scale in the atomic mass number, and so you're going to be able to gain some energy from the fission. So here's fission on the left. A neutron comes into the U-235, splits the larger element and two or more smaller ones, and gives off a great deal of energy. For fusion, we're going to join two light elements together, two or more lighter atoms into a larger one, and you're going to get a lot of energy after, out of that but it's very difficult to make that happen. I've been reading recently, they're trying to do fusion as a much cleaner source of power, but in order to get these, where's my laser, where's my laser? There it is. In order to get this to happen, you need to raise the temperature in the process to about 100 million degrees centigrade, which is what's in the center of the sun. Natural radioactive decay, you don't need to look at all of this and understand it, but what I want to show you is if you start with uranium-238, it has a half-life of four and a half billion years, and it decays. And as we go down this chart, we're getting alpha decay emitter emitters. If we go kind of sideways and upward, they're beta emitters. So U-238, four and a half billion years later, half of it is gone. That's why we know that the Earth is not much more than a few billion years old, or there wouldn't be any uranium left. But as it goes through, you can see, or you probably can't see, but there's days, weeks, months, seconds, minutes, but it, the end result is everything wants to decay down to lead. And if I can read it, 82206 is stable. So a lot of the products that we get from any kind of a, a fission will ultimately decay down and to become stable lead. Now, Marie Curie discovered radium, and you can see radium about midway up on the chart. Right there. So, but radium also decayed, but she and her husband discovered radium and won the Nobel Prize. I haven't discovered anything, so I don't have any prizes. Naturally occurring uranium is composed of three major isotopes. Remember, equal place. So they have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Uranium-238 is the most... Okay, laser there. Every once in a while. Well, you can see it there. U-238, over 99% of all the naturally occurring 
isotopes of uranium. Uranium-235 is seven-tenths of a percent, and uranium-234 is way less than that. So here's what we have to do to have fission. In the upper right, we have a thermal neutron, that means a slowly moving neutron, is absorbed by U-235, becomes U-236, which is massively unstable, and it breaks off into, in this case, krypton and barium. But those are highly energetic particles because it was a big explosion on the small scale, but those elements are running around in the fuel and making heat. And it's going to give off an average of about two and a half fast neutrons. So in order to have a chain reaction, we have to get these fast neutrons thermalized and slowed down until they're thermal neutrons, and you can run this chain around. Um, Otto Hahn and uh, Heisenberg discovered fusion in U-235 in 1939. And then Leo Zillard says, hey, we, maybe we can make a bomb out of this. If we can get those neutrons slowed down and back in to the uranium-235. Okay, this you don't need to worry about very much, but what it's showing us is the distribution of fission products when we have a fission. So it's asymmetrical. They're not equal parts, except in a very tiny case but mostly it's a couple of elements around a mass of 95 and a mass of around 137. So again, here's what's going on. A thermal neutron goes into U-235, makes U-236 because it doesn't change the number of protons in the atom, just number of neutrons, but that's unstable. And it decays in this case to these two plus three neutrons, given off 177 MeV, million electron volts. The scientists like to use millions of electron volts because you can convert that to mass or you can uh, convert it into energy. Okay, so down here, neutrons that can initiate a chain reaction, but they are fast neutrons. So what can happen to these fast neutrons as you've had one fission? It's the four-factor formula, but it's telling us what's happening. If K is greater than one, you have more fissions in this current generation than you did in the last generation. And so looking in here, in the number of fast neutrons per fission is about two and a half. The ratio of neutrons produced by fast fission, there will be some fast fission, fast neutron in U-238 occasionally will cause a fission and make plutonium-239. So you get a few extra neutrons out of fast fission, but then the rest of them, if they're bouncing around and slowing down, then they could be captured by something else uh, carbon, steel, the control rod, the uh, other poisons in a reactor. So this is the fraction of fast neutrons that actually get slowed down to thermal neutrons. And then F is the fraction of neutrons absorbed by fuel rather than somewhere else in the reactor. Of course, if you want a bomb, you don't care much about that. You want it all to stick together long enough to make a big boom. Okay. Uranium must be enriched in U-235 in order to have a chain reaction. That's not entirely true because Enrico Fermi, I'll show you his reactor in a little while, uh, did it with natural uranium and... Uh, carbon for his moderator. So we have to enrich it. 
Now, my reactor at Cornell was in the low vicinity, 3 to 5 percent of enriched uranium. It was an unpressurized water reactor, and so it needed a little boost in order to be able to have sustainable fissions. U-35 is highly enriched above 20 percent for some purposes, naval reactors, and a lot of other reactors. And in, in fact, the, I think the Navy reactors were running about 90% U-235. Okay. So it must be enriched above 90% weapons grade for bombs. And we'll see about that in a minute. So U-235 is concentrated out of U-235. 230 natural uranium, you make a uranium hexafluoride, UF6. It's a gas, and you can take advantage of the slight atomic weight differences between 235 and 238. It is really tricky. Gaseous diffusion through membranes is what they were doing at Oak Ridge. Centrifuge separation with high-speed centrifuges is what Iran is doing they were not happy with. There's a laser separation, and I haven't got a clue how that works because they hadn't invented lasers when I was studying all this stuff. Thermal diffusion because, again, the UF6 atom with U-235 is a little bit different in weight, negligible amount, difference in weight, so it can be separated out by thermal diffusion. So the mass of fizzo material necessary for a chain reaction is called a critical mass. It can be calculated. When I was at Cornell uh, running my 100 watt reactor, um, the fuel was can be adjusted to a, a water to fuel ratio of one to one up to four to one, and we made measurements on what difference that was and what difference it made. But you can calculate, knowing the, the way the fuel rods are made, what the critical mass would be. Now, the reactor that I had was on the third floor of the reactor building, about 150 feet above a natural creek down in the gorge. But I still had to design the fuel storage rack so that it would not go critical when the third floor room got flooded somehow. If you're approaching criticality, it has to be handled very carefully. And there have been a number of criticality accidents in various places around the world because they, in early days, they didn't know exactly how much it would take to make a critical mass. So some scientists were kind of stacking the stuff together to see what would happen. And a guy at Los Alamos stacked a little too much plutonium together, and it went critical, and he was able to knock the thing apart, but he died of exposure to radiation. It must be stored so that the components never reach critical mass in any foreseeable, or even like I was talking about, an unforeseeable situation of the third floor flooding. It's typically a spherical mass that you're calculating, but you can calculate it for other geometries as well. It depends on the density of materials in the mass, and I'll show you that in a minute when we get to how to make a bomb. This is a uranium bomb. And if I can find my laser again. Okay, there's a conventional explosive charge here, and we have these rings of some U-235. They're hollow, and you shoot it down this barrel until they surround this cylinder target, and then it has become a critical mass, and boom. Another way to do it, and when I was a kid here in Gainesville, they had some kind of a display that came through to show 
this kind of a bomb. It was just showing two hemispheres blown together, and that works as well. But the plutonium is not a suitable subject for making a bomb like the uranium bomb. It's not stable enough, and it's not, uh, it's not safe enough. So the way they made that was they had a sphere of plutonium here in the middle. It's surrounded by high explosives with a containment metal. And then all of these explosives, there's probably maybe 50 or 60 of them, maybe more, but they have to be set off simultaneously. So the wires have to be cut exactly the right length to the exploders. And in order to have a plutonium bomb, that explosion has to go off to increase the mass, the density of the plutonium. And remember I said, if it's, if it's more dense, you can make a chain reaction. And this is the way plutonium bombs work. Now, if you want to make a hydrogen bomb, you put some deuterium and some tritium, which are the uh, isotopes of hydrogen that have extra neutrons in a container in the middle of this plutonium. And by the time you set the plutonium off to be a nuclear weapon, the center of it is hot enough to cause the tritium and the uh, deuterium to make the hydrogen bomb. So that's the principle of how the, the plutonium implosion bomb works. This is the original reactor that went critical. It was under the football stadium in Stagg Field in Chicago. They were working in New York City before, and I think somebody in New York City thought, well, this is kind of dangerous to do in Manhattan. Let's take it to Chicago. They don't care. So they went into Chicago, and Enrico Fermi was the designer of this. This was some 40,000 ultra-pure graphite blocks that had within them occasionally throughout some centered natural uranium, which was specially processed. And they had control rods of cadmium. And somewhere, which I can't see up here, they had another super control rod, which if Fermi said, get out, scram, that was the origin of the scram for a nuclear reactor. He was to take his ax, cut the rope that held up the scram rod, cut the rope, let the thing fall, then everybody could run away and see what was left of the stadium. As he got closer and closer to criticality, which he could measure by counting the radioactive discharges from the uranium that was undergoing fission, as he got closer and closer, he decided it did not need to be a cube. It could be really more spherical, and that's the way it ended up looking. December 2nd, 1942. So in order to have a reactor do something useful for us, <clears throat> we have to have a way to slow down these fast neutrons resulting from the fission on the left through some sort of a moderator, Fermi was using the carbon blocks, graphite, and they will bounce around. As they bounce around, they lose energy. The moderator gains some energy, but not much. They lose energy and they can cause another reaction and now you've got a chain reaction going on. So that's basically how it works. So, the control rods are orangey brown. Fuel rods, I'm sorry, are orangey brown. The control rods are green. They are some kind of a neutron absorbing material. Cadmium, hafnium, boron are all very good absorbers of thermal neutrons. So if you, if you raise the control rods up, then the reaction can start, and you can see the heat being developed 
in the fuel rod shown by orangey color instead of just brownish red. So like it says, my reactor at Cornell was unpressurized water, so I didn't have a container at the top. It was just open to our, our mechanism for raising the control rods. So the advantages of pressurized water, it's readily available and cheap. It doesn't become highly radioactive. That is, it's not going to absorb a lot of the neutrons that you're trying to slow down to make your chain reaction. It's a good neutron moderator because hydrogen proton is the same size as the neutron. If you take two billion bards, two billiard balls, and smash them together, you can get an idea of the way neutrons are banging around in the hydrogen molecule in water in order to slow down to become a thermal neutron and then be absorbed in the fuel. It has a negative thermal coefficient of reactivity. This is very important for reactor safety. And I, one of the things I had to do with my reactor at Cornell was measure the thermal coefficient of reactivity. So I, I borrowed an air conditioning unit from the mechanical engineering department, and I would chill the water down to as cold as I could get it. And then I would measure the reactivity where the control rods came at that temperature. Then I would run it down through the steam heater and I would heat it up. So I went from about 40 degrees F to around 100 degrees and measured the reactivity. And it turns out our our four to one water to ratio fuel in that reactor had a positive temperature coefficient of reactivity. And as a result, we had to shut that reactor down and never operate it again. The others all had negative temperature coefficients of reactivity. So this is a stylized mechanical drawing of a pressurized water reactor. And the important thing is everything from here to the right, those are steam turbines, steam condensers, and pumps to pump the water back into the reactor. There's nothing new about that that hasn't been used in the coal-fired and the gas-fired power plants all around the world or in the coal-fired and oil-fired Navy ships that have steam turbines. But what we're seeing different here is we have a steam generator. How does that work? Well, this is the primary coolant, pressurized water. Here's the pressurizer to keep the water pressure higher than the steam pressure at that temperature. So the oil have any boiling in the reactor. So the, they're having flow through here, pick up heat, goes through the steam generator, makes steam, steam goes out and around the circle. So you have to have a pressurizer and a steam generator and you're in business. So I wanna just tell you the definition of some terms. Coming out of the reactor, in this particular reactor is steam, and that's the megawatt thermal energy that the reactor is creating. That thermal energy is converted by the steam through the turbine and around the cycle again, and it will put some gross mechanical output, and some of that is used to run these pumps that I showed you earlier. So the gross megawatts electric are before you hook it to the grid. After you hook it to the grid, it's the net megawatts electric. And reactor plants are maybe 30% effective in uh, terms of how much heat you created to how much heat you actually turned into electricity. So what we learned today, naturally occurring uranium is not explosive. You have to wear, work really hard to make a bomb, and you have to work even harder to make 
a safe reactor. So what we're going to learn next week, the discoveries and experiments by men and women that led up to uranium fission, the German scientists proved uranium could fission, U.S. and foreign scientists here escaping from Europe during the 30s were worried that Germany would develop an atomic bomb. So U.S. initiated the Manhattan Project, and that's what we'll talk about next week. So these, you can't read it, and it doesn't matter. But Leo Zillard, the guy who said you could probably make a bomb out of U-235 fissioning, he wrote a letter for Einstein. And over here, if you can see it enough, it's signed by Albert Einstein. And he pointed out the difficulty of not getting a nuclear bomb before Germany did because they were working on it. They were working with heavy water reactors, thinking that they had to have that. We worked with graphite reactors, and that was the difference. We, we had a head start. We had most of the scientists in the world here in the United States, and they worked on the Manhattan Project it was spending a billion dollars a year in the 1940s. It's like $20 billion a year now. So the Manhattan Project is the thing everybody says, oh, I've got this fantastic program for detecting submarines. And if it really works, it'll be as big as the Manhattan Project. Nothing ever was. If anybody was really interested, I could really put you to sleep talking about elementary particles that make up neutrons and protons and all of the other things. But to understand this, you don't need that. I taught you everything you needed to know to make your own bonds. Okay, any questions in here? Yes. Where does a super collider fit into what you've told us today? The super collider, particularly the one in uh, Switzerland, is the Large Hadron Collider. They are colliding protons against protons at nearly the speed of light under extremely difficult conditions, and they're creating, creating other particles to study. So that's where they finally found the Higgs boson, was in the super collider. But they're simply a way of looking at subatomic particles to see what are their characteristics, how long do they last, what do they do, is it going to turn us into a black hole? It didn't. So that's what they do. How much uh, did the fuel weigh for the first atomic bomb? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm, what, what's it? It's about 15 kilograms. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, how much uh, did the uranium in the first nuclear bomb weigh? And I don't remember the real number to you. It was about 25 kilograms. Yeah, Yeah, 25 kilograms, more or less. And, and much of about it, 60 pounds. And much of it was blown away. So the actual, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there isn't much residue. So other questions? Any questions on Zoom? Another one here in the Oak Room. Okay. Are we still doing a lot of research in atomic energy other than making uh, uh, plants? Yes, there is quite a bit of research going on. I just found an article on the web yesterday. Uh, Bill Gates is building a reactor facility near a coal mine in Wyoming so that those coal miners will have jobs when they run out of the coal mining. And that will be a liquid metal fueled reactor putting its heat into a, a liquid salt and then using it to create steam. Uh, it, it was a very interesting looking reactor. I'll talk about that some when we talk about the types of reactors. But yes, there is research going on. Uh, GE Hitachi is very big in research, and they are under contract to 
to do the research and then build that reactor. But it has some promise because it will actually burn up the uranium-238, turning it into plutonium. It's a fast breeder reactor. So the fast neutrons are the ones that are making the reacting the uh, reactions and the fissions. And then it's turning the, the uh, plutonium into uh, a fuel. And then it can also burn the radioactive materials so it can be used to try to burn up some of the fuel left over from real uh, fuel reprocessing facilities because they still can fission if you're lucky. <laughs> so what does it mean that Iran is moving closer to uh, nuclear fission? Uh, through their centrifuges. What is that? Mean? Well, they're, they're using their centrifuges to concentrate the U-235. And they had the agreement before we backed out of it that they could only enrich U-235 to a small percentage, maybe 10%, that would be useful in power reactors, but not for making a bomb. But now they're, if you run that through the loop several times, you can reconcentrate each time you run it through a whole bank of, of uh, compressors, you get a higher amount of U-235, and I think they're up to, I think I saw 20%. So, and they, the words that you hear, are there one month from making a nuclear bomb, or maybe not? So, any other questions? Go back to your naps. <laughs> Thank you for being with us, Walter. <laughs> Wonderful presentation. Thank you.